Is there any meaning to life that will not be annihilated by death? We are all familiar with the idea of an existential crisis, that we might wake up one day and find everything we currently hold dear not only undesirable, but actually slightly repulsive. We will lose the sense that existence is worth it, scraping through our lives, nothing externally changing, yet inside becoming dull and hollow. It can strike without warning, indiscriminately, to any person. Yet it can rob us of even a hope of happiness by making even our own pleasure seem completely meaningless. An unfillable hole would have opened up within our hearts. But whether you're currently going through this now or will do in the future, you are in luck. Because we have the accounts of some of the greatest minds in history to tell us about their experiences of this uniquely human problem. And one of my favourites of these is the confession of Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, where he examines his own quagmire of despair and how he started to climb out of it. Get ready to learn why existential crises are so terrifying, how irrational problems sometimes require irrational solutions, and what to do when reason and happiness collide. As always, bear in mind that I'll be unable to cover the full depth of Tolstoy's thought here, and I really do encourage you to read this for yourself. Unsurprisingly, it's really good. But let's start by examining how Tolstoy describes the feeling of his existential crisis, because he touches upon something that philosophers often overlook, and it brings the urgency of existential problems into focus. 1. The Brutality of Nihilism From Nietzsche to Kierkegaard to Sartre to Dostoevsky, philosophers have warned against the dark spectre of nihilism. Often described as a distressing state where life seems pointless, nihilism has been used to prophesy the fall of civilizations, make sense of people taking their own lives, and explain the downfall of whole religions. But here, Tolstoy describes a component of nihilism that is often ignored, how it can come knocking at your door unannounced, just when you ought to feel so happy. At the time he is writing, Tolstoy is at the height of his fame. He has published War and Peace and Anna Karenina and cemented himself as one of the greatest novelists of all time. Not only that, but he is a respected intellectual, as well as a member of the aristocracy. He boasts a large estate, riches that will keep him comfortable for the rest of his life, and a reputation that won't be forgotten until the names Shakespeare and Virgil are also wiped from the history books. In short, he has not only everything he ever wanted, but everything he could want. And not just in the realm of material success, he also had a wife and children that he loved with all his heart. But gradually, all of this stops bringing him joy. Initially, he cannot quite explain why, but one by one they begin to strike him as pointless. He looks back on all of his great novels as meaningless trivialities, not achieving much of anything and ultimately unimportant in the grand scheme of things. He becomes actively cognizant of his own mortality in a way that he never was before. And so when he looks at his family, all he can see are future particles of ash, carefully assembled to fool him into thinking that they are worth something. Like the Buddha before him, he becomes overwhelmed with the suffering of the world. All the work that the Russian peasantry undertake to keep him and his class afloat strikes him as repulsive, as he realises it is all for naught. He had been previously told that this was just the natural way of things, that he was entitled to this service as an aristocrat. But now he can no longer believe these hollow justifications. The whole world strikes him as repellent, dishonest and empty. At the same time, he wonders why he even cares that the Russian peasantry are suffering since their suffering also is meaningless. None of his reasons for going on seem at all sufficient, and he describes himself as a man desperately holding onto a branch, about to fall into the jaws of a dragon. And I want to follow this point through a little bit further, because I think this quite accurately describes the unique terror of an existential crisis. According to Schopenhauer, one of the things that our minds do very, very well is promise us happiness and satisfaction. They are constantly whispering in our ear that if we only do this or that, then we will finally be content with our lot in life. Perhaps they will tell us to become more attractive or to achieve great riches and fame. And if we do manage to achieve this, then our minds will leave us alone for a while. But then, just like the sun rises each morning, it will creep back into our consciousness and request something else. In some ways, this isn't a bad thing. It gives us enough to do from cradle to grave to stop us going mad or losing hope even though it also makes the prospect of permanent satisfaction seem pretty much impossible. But Tolstoy is in a very particular position. He has successfully heeded the voice of his desires for decades. He has actually achieved as much as anyone could possibly ask for. 
What writer would not want to be in Tolstoy's position? Financially secure, happily married, and the fruit of his pen immortalised by its depth and profundity. His will should have run out of things to desire, but rather than become quiet and restrained, as we might hope, it instead begins clawing wildly at something it cannot quite define. Not content with any finite accomplishment, it now desires the infinite. It wants God and heaven and a guarantee of immortality. In short, it begins to desire things Tolstoy highly doubts even exist, let alone are achievable for him. But within this account is an idea nothing short of horrifying, that even if we achieve everything we've ever wanted, we still won't be happy. And not only that, but the lie our will has told us about our endless contentment will finally be revealed. It will cascade down the line to make all of our achievements seem hollow in retrospect. After all, all of that was in service of the idea that one day we will be happy, that our wills will finally let us rest. But for Tolstoy, this does not happen. The will's ambitions only grow to start to desire things that Tolstoy doesn't even believe in. Existential crises are often referred to as luxury issues, and to a certain extent, I think this is absolutely true. It's sort of hard to have an existential crisis if you are actively starving, because you'll be too busy trying to find food. However, I think we make a mistake when we use this to dismiss existential concerns. Surely, the despair of an existential crisis is brought on precisely because it is a luxury issue. It carries this insidious message that says, you will never be happy, no matter what you do. Look, you would have killed to be in this position, and yet now you are here, it is all hollow, all vanity. It represents the idea that satisfaction itself could be a myth for us, that the best we can hope for are the temporary reprieves brought on by a lull in our cloying wills, that even with glory, a loving family, and our every wish attended to, we can still find it within us to be miserable. It shatters a promise that many of us were told from a very young age, that our lives may be painful or filled with suffering, but on the other side of that suffering, there is something that makes it all worth it, that justifies it. For some people, this is a theistic God and the idea of heaven, but for others, it might just be the vague idea that our work is going to pay off, that we will reap the emotional dividends of our labor. Tolstoy raises the possibility that this idea is simply false that our endless quest for happiness is doomed from the start, that if we are joyful now, it is only because of an illusion, and one that our rationality will eventually strip away. In effect, it raises the troubling proposition that happiness itself is fundamentally foolish. And Tolstoy's luxurious position is just what makes his existential crisis so troubling. If we are extraordinarily lucky, then this is the future we might look forward to. Hollow and miserable, surrounded by gold. But, having established the importance of existential crises, I now want to examine one of Tolstoy's most interesting ideas. The creative ways he thinks we try to run from the void. If you want to help me make more videos like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel or my Patreon if you're feeling very generous. The links are in the description. 2. Four Futile Paths Culturally, we recognize a number of stock responses people have to existential crises. We picture people having an affair, or buying a sports car, or launching into self-destructive cycles of behavior. Many of us will have seen people actively exhibit these, or other classically nihilistic patterns of action. But surprisingly, we don't tend to ask why. We often chalk up whatever they're doing to their erratic state without recognizing the underlying logic behind these seemingly insane decisions. But Tolstoy creates a loose typology of responses to the emptiness of life. And I think that looking at them can give us a real insight into how we might react when the spectre of nihilism is seen at our door. Tolstoy's first method is the most straightforward, and it is simply to try to be as ignorant about the issue as humanly possible. This might come from a sheer unwillingness to look existential questions in the face, but also in some good old-fashioned emotional repression. We attempt to ignore the elephant in the room and our creeping sense of dread at its presence, in the hopes that one day it will show itself out without us having to lift a finger. Tolstoy himself is a bit dismissive of this response, but to be honest, I have a certain amount of sympathy towards it. It actually makes quite a lot of sense. Someone undergoing an existential crisis may not even realize this is what's happening. All they know is that they are slowly finding their life less and less meaningful, and that they see value in fewer and fewer things. In such a position, it is very tempting to just ignore the problem. Considering it seemed to have no specific cause for entering our lives, maybe one day it will leave as well and everything will be returned to normal. 
However, Tolstoy argues that this strategy will ultimately be unsuccessful, and I am inclined to agree. When we have come face to face with the seeming emptiness of life, and not just in a cold intellectual fashion, but in an emotional way as well, that is very difficult to unsee. It is why Camus depicts the realization of life's absurdity as a curse, our own rational natures playing a cruel joke on us, revealing the one truth that we never wanted to learn. At the very least, Tolstoy finds that he cannot simply ignore the challenge posed by life's emptiness, and so he must find some other way. Tolstoy's second path is a form of hedonism that he calls Epicureanism, but I am just going to say hedonism because I don't want to perpetuate the myth that Epicurus was some sort of libertine debaucher. The hedonistic route is, in effect, another form of distraction from the problem, but this time by throwing ourselves at one of the only things that tends to strike us as intrinsically desirable, pleasure itself. So someone taking this road might become addicted to adrenaline or find themselves striving after higher and higher states of physical intoxication. According to Tolstoy, this was how most people with the means to do so attempted to escape nihilism. And we have good reason to suspect that this too is a doomed path. Ironically, Epicurus himself warned about this approach to life. For him, it was imperative that we not get in the habit of seeking greater and greater states of pleasure because we will soon become trapped on a hedonic treadmill. Once we get used to a given state of enjoyment, that in itself will no longer be sufficient, it will just feel like another day at the office. Just like we would become accustomed to higher and higher doses of certain drugs and so require more and more to feel their effects, Epicurus would say this type of crude hedonism will eventually come back to bite us. Not only will it stop giving us active joy, but we will start to compare the rest of our lives to these heightened, intoxicated states, and so the rest of existence will feel drab by comparison. I particularly like this aspect of Tolstoy's analysis, because hedonism is normally considered a symptom of nihilism rather than a response to it. Characters like Svidrigailov from Crime and Punishment are considered nihilists because they value nothing apart from their own pleasure. But Tolstoy would say these people are trying to resist the tug of nihilism by giving themselves over to pleasure. It's a very interesting perspective, and it really made me stop and consider the relationship between nihilism and hedonism, and perhaps have a bit more sympathy for the hedonistic response, stemming as it does from total existential desperation. Thirdly, Tolstoy says there are people who just end their own lives. There's not too much to say here other than that I hope that you don't take this path, but it does really highlight the stakes of existential questions and coming up with solutions to them. It's literally a, a life and death matter, and you only need to take a glance at some pretty depressing statistics to realize that. To expand on Tolstoy's point, I would also see the sorts of self-destructive behaviors people sometimes engage in during an existential crisis as variants on this path. People who destroy their own lives through making decisions that they know will do them harm are essentially giving off the same message. My life does not matter too much, and neither do I. Anyone feeling like this in particular has my deepest sympathies. But finally, Tolstoy outlines his own wretched state. He says the fourth way is suffering from nihilism, but no longer having the heart or the energy to take any of the other paths. This is feeling the pain of nihilism in its unfettered form and yet still plodding along. Tolstoy continues to live out of inertia, but he does not want to retreat into pleasure and he cannot rediscover his innocent ignorance. This is arguably the sort of nihilism Shakespeare gives voice to with his famous monologue from Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Though Tolstoy thinks that hedonism is the most common response to an existential crisis, I might disagree today. Anecdotally, I actually think that this fourth path is incredibly popular. All-out hedonism tends to require means that quite a lot of people don't have access to. But I do see an awful lot of people just trudge along in their lives while at the same time finding them totally pointless. Again, it highlights the stakes of existential questions. That is a horrifying existence to live. And I think to a greater or lesser extent, many of us have been there. But on that cheery note, I want to move on to how Tolstoy describes the general cause of his existential crisis and how it reflects a long-running theme in the history of nihilism. 3. Faith, Reason and Conflict The classic analysis a lot of people give for the rise of nihilism is something like, as a belief in God declined, people lost their sense of meaning and purpose. This is one reason why Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky explicitly recommend going back to religion as a means of combating existential despair. 
But, of course, there is clearly a problem here. Even if we assume that they are right and a belief in God would solve our existential worries, how do we even go about doing that? It is very difficult to secure a belief in the long term if you don't genuinely think it is rational to hold it. This is why Plato thought that justification was an essential component of knowledge. It is what held it firm in the face of challenge and kept our belief consistent enough that it could be a guide to life. At the time of having his crisis, Tolstoy had been a loose atheist for many years. He had been raised in the Orthodox Church, but he just could not bring himself to believe in the sacramental reality of their practices. Baptism and the Eucharist and the doctrine of the resurrection struck him as absurd, and no matter what he did, he just could not get himself to accept these teachings. And he genuinely did try. He tried to accept them on faith. But he saw this inability to believe as a real problem, because when he asked who could truly bear existential despair, it was not the intellectuals or the learned clergy, it was rather the devout faith of the Russian peasantry. They endured more hardship than Tolstoy ever had, so how had they coped? Well, on Tolstoy's analysis, it was the strength of their faith, but not just an intellectual acceptance of their religion, but a real, lived faith, one that directed much of their actions. So, Tolstoy seems to be in a bit of a bind here. On the one hand, he sees faith as the only way out of his troubles, but at the same time, he thinks he cannot achieve it without betraying his reason. And it wouldn't even matter if he was willing to make this trade, because beliefs that, deep down, we think are unjustified are notoriously unstable. But this is where Tolstoy asks a brilliant question that we often gloss over. Why exactly does religion seem to help existential despair? We often take it for granted because empirically it just seems to be true. But what is the causative mechanism here? Is there a particular belief common to all or most faiths that allows them to achieve this? And if so, can we replicate it without having outright theism? In Tolstoy's opinion, the answer is incredibly complicated and actually changes from essay to essay. But overall, it leans towards loosely yes. In his brilliant essay examining the essence of religion, he asks what it is that religion sets out to answer. And for him, it all boils down to clarifying our relationship with the infinite. That is, with concepts like God or eternity or heaven or immortality. Back in the first section, we suggested that while humans are finite beings, we can still desire infinity. We can want not just life, but eternal life, not just goodness, but a being of infinite goodness. For Tolstoy, we see a universe that is so much bigger than us and we want to make sense of it. This is the task of faith. It runs parallel to ordinary empirical inquiry, and while it is amenable to reason, in some way it precedes it, because it supplies our first premises about what ought to be the case, not just what is, something that mere empiricism is famously poorly placed to do. It's difficult to say a lot here, because Tolstoy does not work out this relationship between faith and empirical inquiry in strict analytic detail. But ultimately, he wanted faith to do two things. Make sense of our relationship to this mysterious infinity or whole in a psychologically satisfactory manner, and do this without directly contradicting our rationality. So for him, the pure essence of religion consists of a few key ideas. That there is some creative order to the universe, that there is a right and wrong way to behave towards our fellow man, and that our lives matter, not just now, but after death as well. The first of these needs is traditionally filled by a creator, the second by religious ethics, and the final one by the promise of immortality. And Tolstoy leans towards these answers as well, but I find his overall point very interesting, because at least in theory, we don't need these particular answers, just satisfactory ones to the three challenges. It seems like the key part of Tolstoy's worldview doing all of their heavy lifting here is the concept of normativity. This is a fancy philosophical word that essentially just means imbued with value or inherently desirable. That is, it carries the implication that there are things that should and should not be the case. We see this sort of thing come up most commonly in ethics, but it is a key part of existentialism as well. The myth of Sisyphus famously opens with the question, why should I continue to live? And that is a should question. Camus is asking for a justification to carry on living, something with normative force. Hell, even the idea of rationality itself contains normative components. It separates the ways we ought to reason from the ways we ought not to. 
Hence the brilliant observation of C.S. Pierce that logic is a normative science. And it seems like an open question whether we need a deity for this. While Plato and the Stoics were both theists in a loose sense of the word, all the work in their worldviews was being done by the idea of a universal logic or universal reason to the movements of the universe. This is one reason the Stoics were such big fans of acting in accordance with nature. For them, nature was not just a description of how the world was, but was a much richer concept which included how the world ought to be. For the Stoics, nature was not just powerful and awe-inspiring, it was just. This idea of a reasonable universe is also the method through which theistic thinkers tend to get at the inherent normativity of the world. A good example of this is the philosopher Boethius. It is this normativity that Tolstoy wants to latch onto, and in elucidating this, he brings the philosophical problem of meaning into sharper focus. He also clarifies what we would need to do to have objective meaning without God. We would need to get at this normativity through other means. But it is not all smooth sailing, because while Tolstoy opens the door for meaning without God, he doesn't tell us how to walk through it, and even he didn't walk through it. His solution to nihilism is still fundamentally theistic, even if it is critical of the particulars of Christianity. But I want to follow this thought through a little bit further, by exploring some parallels that this 19th century existential philosophy has with its much older cousin, ethics. 4. Finding normativity, an open challenge. The quintessential existential question is, what is the meaning of life? Sometimes we conceive of this as its own philosophical issue, neatly cleaved off from the more analytic problems of language, logic, ethics, and metaphysics. But this is a relatively new view. For the pre-Socratics, these issues were simply too closely intertwined to separate. And even Aristotle, often credited with forming these different schools of philosophy, thought that they each impacted one another at a fundamental level with politics depending on ethics which depended on metaphysics and so on and so forth. Additionally, the post-enlightenment gap we have between description and prescription had not yet been fully elucidated. It was much more of a blurry line. In Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, the question of how to live a good life is intimately connected with how people actually do live their lives. For a lot of ancient philosophers, there just isn't the neat separation between the descriptive world and the normative one. There's almost this underlying unspoken assumption that the world is already infused with normativity, sometimes because of this idea that the universe is inherently reasonable that we examined in the last section. It's a view that we now find quite difficult to get our heads round, because we inevitably want to ask, where does the normativity come from? If I'm a well-behaved analytic philosopher, I want to be provided with a deductive argument that takes all of the facts about what is and exists in the world, and infers from them some further fact about what ought to be that I cannot directly perceive. But this is a really post-enlightenment way of looking at the question. For someone like Plato, we did perceive what ought to be directly, using our intellectual faculties. In effect, Tolstoy ends up asserting a similar proposition in some of his essays. He says that the world already tells us what is valuable and what is right, but that it does so through our intuitions. This is something of an existential precursor to the views of the moral intuitionists of the 20th century, who would defend a very similar idea about ethical propositions. The trouble is, if we have broadly naturalist leanings, this can strike us as all a little bit far-fetched. Where does the ought emerge from all that merely is? If you are not already on board with the whole directly perceiving value thing, it's very hard to make this a persuasive worldview. It seems to fly in the face of what we now consider rational. But this is where some philosophers have argued that needing a reason for life should not be considered a logical or rational challenge, but instead some sort of psychological illness. For thinkers like Nietzsche, attempting to solve nihilism through rationality alone was besides the point. Whether or not meaning and value objectively exist, Nietzsche thought that healthy humans would naturally perceive their lives as meaningful, unless we allowed our wills to become weakened or disorganized, and then we would question why we are here and what the point of our actions are, instead of just acting and seeing the question of whether that action is valuable as basically absurd or incomprehensible. Likewise, for Kierkegaard, nihilism just would not occur to someone who was truly committed to their life, and who was not suffering from one of his many causes of despair. Ideally, he also thought this would take place in a religious context, but what Kierkegaard exactly means by religion is its own discussion, I don't want to get into it here. So we'll just stick with talking about commitment for now. For both of these thinkers, reason was just not up to the challenge of defeating nihilism. It had to be accomplished either by strengthening your will to power, in the case of Nietzsche, or in an unconditional commitment to something, in the case of Kierkegaard. 
For these thinkers, the ancient view that the world was inherently normative is closer to the truth. Under this view, the value of life is not something we can prove rationally, but it's also not the sort of thing that reason is well equipped to handle. Without any normativity at all, we can't even say that reason is in any way better than unreason. For them, an existential crisis is only partly a problem of philosophy, but it's also an issue that transcends rationality itself. And while I think this analysis definitely requires further clarification, I do think that it is on to something. One of the things that makes existential crises so difficult to combat is that they appear to blend together many different problems. They have one foot in psychology, one foot in philosophy, and another in theology. Hell, you can get an existential crisis by not sleeping enough. That will very quickly rob you of your will to live. And in recognizing this extra rational component, Tolstoy helps to shed some light on what makes an existential crisis so potentially destabilizing. It is a sort of super problem that finds its origins in a whole confluence of factors. But this makes it very hard to dig yourself out of one. It is what leads people to say, I know I should be happy, but I'm just not. Tolstoy had to solve it with a leap of faith. For someone else, it might be that they have a disorganized will. For a third person, it might just be that their straightforward physiological needs are not being met. And if you are in the middle of suffering from an existential crisis, it's very difficult to tell which of these is the case. One of the things I really like about Tolstoy's analysis is that he is not approaching the issue quite like a traditional philosopher. And so he is able to elucidate all of these non-philosophical aspects that might go over our heads. But this, in turn, raises a pretty distressing question. What if this is a hole we cannot think or act our way out of? And we better work on finding solutions fast, because as we said, an existential crisis poses a pretty unique problem for us. It can rob us of the idea not just that we will be consistently happy, but we even can be consistently happy. And I'd really like to get your opinion on this, because I'm still very much forming my thoughts. To what extent do you see nihilism as a fundamentally philosophical problem, and where do you think other factors come in? And what implications does this have for the way we might solve nihilism, both on a personal and on a societal level? It is fascinating food for thought, and it makes Tolstoy's confession a real fresh perspective on the issue of existential despair. But if you want to see a totally different perspective on existential crises, then click here to watch my video on Albert Camus' brilliant novel The Fall, where he charts one man's journey into the bowels of misery. And stick around for more on thinking to improve your life.